So I'm Chris Moody. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm here to talk about content marketing. So we do have 30 minutes. I'm between you and lunch. The last time I spoke, I was between the bar. So I think lunch is better than the bar. But for some reason, I get sandwiched between these. And my time did move. So thank you, Adam, rushing people for lunch. But um, I'm going to talk about the importance of content marketing, some things you can do to help create more content, and some of the things that we're seeing. So. Um, in the intro, I was with Compendium. Um, it was a content marketing platform based out of Indianapolis. Um, the founder of the company also co-founded Exact Target. So if you guys know, that was acquired by Salesforce for uh, $2.6 billion with a B. Um, we were focused on creating ways for everyone to be successful with content marketing. So it was not a huge expenditure. It was not something that only the bigger companies could do. And we'll talk about some of the things that we've learned and how everyone can be successful with content marketing. Uh, this is my son. His name is Branch. I always put this slide in here. No one is doing the uh, typical, well, I have this one too. Like Beyonce is showing up on marketing slides now. So if you guys see that, like I have the Beyonce picture. I also have zombies, kittens, and cute kids. So usually at marketing, events, you have to one-up everyone else, but now like no one has done that. So anyway, there's all that stuff. I do have that's what she said on my wedding band. Um, it's from the office. It's kind of dumb, but I did lose my wedding band about a week ago, and that actually led to me finding it, because I lost it in the gym, and someone saw it, and they were like, I can't pawn this, and they turned it in. So I went, and it was sitting on the counter, and then it led to a story about how I'm a dork, and I have the office on my wedding band. So this slide's going to build here, but I want to talk first about where marketing is right now. I think the presenters before have done a great job of doing that, and this fits right in with everything that's been said. But data is showing right now that 75% of CEOs want their CMOs to become 100% ROI focused. 100%, which should scare everyone in this room. Because odds are there are some things that are not performing, there are some things that we can't measure, and there's a lot that we do that just feels good, but our CEO wants everything to be measured, which there are some things that innately cannot, some brand equity, stuff like that. You can get indicators, but you can't measure everything. And then 91% of CMOs want to have a data-driven approach to marketing decisions and quantifying value. So the 9% are probably out of a job that don't want to do that, or they work in an industry that doesn't require you to actually do marketing, because you have to know what is happening with the dollars that you spend. But here's what's actually happening. So th there's been a lot of studies on this CMO council. So 88% of CMOs lack an integrated view of customer interactions. So that's understanding what's happening with your audience and figuring out how you can best use that data to your advantage. And 65% of CMOs can't measure ROI across digital marketing investments. So again, these are high numbers. And everyone likes to put social media as something we shouldn't talk about as much now. Like, oh, that's played out. We talked about that five years ago. But we're still not doing it. So we always create this new buzzword, and there's new tools, and we need a Pinterest account. And, oh, brands are using Snapchat. Maybe I need to be on Snapchat. But we're still not actually doing this stuff well. So we need to focus on getting the results we need so we can keep our jobs and continue to prove out that marketing can do what the CEOs want us to do. Building on that, one of the big problems is content. So this is pulled, I don't have these animations on every slide, don't worry, I don't particularly like animations, but I pulled this from a corporate deck. But uh, content is one of the problems. So most people say that content cannot scale. And this is because you stare at a blank screen with a flashing cursor, and it's pretty intimidating. But 60 to 70%, this is the one on the far left there, 60 to 70% of marketing content goes unused each day. And as marketers, you guys know this. It drives us crazy. We create this outstanding piece of content, and no one ever uses it. And that's similar to what Jeff said. You put something on social media, and no one's just going to come. It's not filled of dreams. You don't build it, and people just show up. You actually have to market your marketing, which is something a lot of marketers aren't good at, because it does require a little bit of thick skin to say, here's what we're doing, and promoting that internally and externally. And it's not personalized. So 74% of customers are frustrated that web content doesn't map to their interest. Again, this is a huge issue. And we've been Netflixed and Amazoned and Googled, and everyone knows so much about us. When we log into something, they know what movies we like. 
They know if you're in a relationship, they know your favorite bands, they know when you're out of town. And if they use this data in a non-creepy way, it's awesome. It makes our lives easier. But as marketers, we have to keep up. We have to do that too. So if I know that you're a B2B company, I should not be up here talking about B2C all day. But we're still doing the pray and spray, right? We push everything out there and think that it's amazing for everyone, and that's not what content is about. And then lastly, it's not strategic. So 34% of CMOs believe they have an effective content marketing strategy. So that's really, really small. A lot of people don't even have a strategy around content. They just create things and they'll do a big white paper every quarter and then a webinar around the white paper and then a social media post to promote the webinar in the white paper and then they're like, yes, and that's it. So we have to change that as marketers. Two of my favorite quotes, my favorite is actually on the bottom. So um, if you haven't read the book Utility, Y-O-U by Jay Bear, so Utility, it's an amazing book. And he says in there, stop trying to be amazing, which a lot of people take offense to this. And I get in content marketing dork fights. I mean, it's a really dorky fight. But I argue with people about this because some people think that you need this great, polished piece of content every time. And we love that. We love sharing infographics. And you, there's a place for that. You definitely need that. But it doesn't have to be amazing all the time. It needs to be relevant. And who even defines amazing? We're all different. We may like different things. Some of us don't want the flashy, high production pieces of content. And then Anna Lafter with the Corporate Executive Board, she says that marketing needs to de-emphasize tasks like thought leadership and white papers and focus more on advanced activities. I can tell you personally that I've approved POs for one piece of content that's $60,000. I like awkward silence. <laughs> so that's a lot of money. That could hire a really good marketer. I mean, in this area, $60,000 gets you a pretty good marketer. And I love Google. This is one of the stats from Google. But in 2008, there were a trillion pages indexed on Google, which is a big, huge, scary number. Lots of content. But this is still the time where a lot of us were scrapping and we wanted to be thought leaders. And whatever we marketed, we wanted to have a blog about that, create our personal brand, go to South by Southwest, which I launched a product there in 2009, so I was very guilty of this. But, you know, that was the age where you could become an influencer. You could become one of those guys or gals and put lots of time into that, get lots of traffic. But what's happened in five short years, that number has increased by 30x. So this is 2013, now we're in 2014, and the number goes up every single day. But now there are th over 30 trillion index pages. So if you think you can create an amazing piece of content and get the business results you need, it's not going to happen. People will find it on Google and you will get traffic, but the relevance is what drives you through the funnel. So that's what we like to talk about. You still need the high effort pieces and the great white papers and stuff to get people at the top. But if you want people down here, and if you want retention, it needs to be very relevant to them. This is another term I hate. Who's heard of content shock? Okay, so I'm talking to like four people now. But content shock is something that marketers are saying now, and it's the concept that there's so much content out there, I give up. I am overwhelmed, there's just too much content, I can't take it, I'm shutting down my laptop. It's just crazy. But it's 33,000 results, and this is a new term. I mean, the main article was written in January of 2014. So then everyone blogs about it, and they're like, oh, content shock, that's right. We should stop this content marketing thing. That stuff is bad. <laughs> Who here has bought a car? Okay, raise your hand if you got tired of looking at information about the car you were about to buy. If you said, there's just too much information, I'm just gonna go buy a damn car. Oh, three, Adam, I, Jesus, ruining my presentation. <laughs> you want to know everything you can about your car. You don't want a lemon. You don't want to be on the side of the road with a skateboard. I don't have a skateboard. But you don't want your car to break down. That's a big investment. Who here has been sick? This one I can always tell who's not paying attention. Everybody. So when you're sick, who's been to WebMD? Another show of hands. Yeah. Can everybody read that? So you want all of the information, but 
That's kind of a little content shock, maybe. You're like, oh, I either have a cold or I'm going to die tomorrow. One or the other. These are the symptoms. That's going to happen. But if it's an important decision, you don't really tap out and say, I can't take this anymore. So I think it's a bogus term. Um, if you go to this link, you can write it down or bookmark it, whatever, bit.ly slash content shock BS. Um, we did a webinar. This is Doug Kessler. He's an amazing content marketer with Velocity Partners. And it was Joe Polizzi with Content Marketing Institute. So it was the three of us. It was just a conversation. There weren't really slides, but we talked about content for an hour. And I think you can get that on demand. But it was a really good webinar because everyone has a different viewpoint, and we did disagree. It's not one of those where it's like, oh, I concur. That's great. Content's awesome. Next slide. It's not like that. We did disagree. Some people think you have a higher value and high effort. But it's pretty valuable if you care about content marketing. I would check that out. And I don't get paid to do that. It's with Content Marketing Institute. We just sponsored it, which we did pay for that. OK, so lots of people say, I can't do content. People don't care about my content. But you don't have to be a glamorous industry. Michelle is here. We work together at SunTech Medical. And I used to have a slide in this deck. We had a blood pressure diagnostic station with modular pulse oximetry and temperature. Yes, write a blog post about that. Share that on social media. That gets tons of retweets. But people cared about that. There's a relevant audience that is a practitioner or they're taking people's blood pressure and they care about it. So the example we use is an insurance company. If you're an insurance company, you can think of 30 things to write about at a minimum. So come up with 30 topics. And I'm not going to read these out. That would take forever. But you can see travel insurance, health insurance, umbrella policies, easy claims. Let's assume at a minimum, you create one piece of content for each topic that your audience cares about. So let's say 30, 30 pieces of content. Not too bad. Jeff talked about personas. I'm a big fan of persona-based marketing. You have to market to people. You're not marketing to machines. You may want to rank better, but the machines are getting better at predicting what people want, which is what Google's trying to do, right? Google Now is awesome. I have a phone. I'll never switch to iPhone because I love Android. But it tells me when I need to leave to go to the airport. It knows all this information about me. So this is happening. but. It has to be personalized. So that's demographics, motivations, characteristics. What are they trying to accomplish? Most companies have around five personas. So that may be a differentiated role. So you can have a vice president of marketing type persona, a director level persona, the practitioner. And that could be different types of content you push across. So 30 topics, five personas, 150 pieces of content. Raise your hand. Jeff Cohen, you're disqualified. You can't do this. Raise your hand if you've written 150 pieces of content in the last year. Uh, you can count any, any type of content. Awesome. That's good. That doesn't factor in the sales funnel. So if you look at a funnel, most have five stages. But awareness is very different than retention or sales. The things we do in awareness are extremely different. You should not have the same piece of content and say, oh, this works anywhere in the funnel. If you say that, you're being lazy. It doesn't really work anywhere in the funnel. So count five stages of the funnel. Then you have 750 pieces of content, which is a bigger number. And that scares a lot of people because you're thinking about content as blank page, writing something in a Word doc, or whatever you use, which is not the case. So I'll talk through some examples of how people have thought differently about content and how it works for them. Then you factor in that the smaller the community, the greater the influence. So this is a Technorati study that I love. So 54% agreed. Some people were indifferent, but only 12% disagreed. So there's research that shows when you're in a smaller circle, it's more influential. So if you start to think about content, it needs to be relevant. If I'm talking to the 200 people in this room, it's something that I want to say to each of you. It's not to the 1,000 people that are out on the street or the people that eating at Bojangles, because this college is awesome and has a Bojangles. <laughs> then you factor in that you're pushing this out on social media, and there are tons of channels. They're created every single day. This is Technorati 2. So based on your business being B2B, the numbers vary, but some are more influential than others. So you have to promote that out there. So you're, you need lots of content because you want it to be relevant. You don't want to say the same thing on every single social network. Some people do, but that shows that it's disingenuous. People scroll right past it. The reason they scroll right past it is because 
Facebook, Twitter, all these companies are smart and they're trying to make money and they want to sell ads. They want to sell advertising because we want to get in front of people. And now it's even harder to get in front of people. So there was a question earlier, should you even spend money on Facebook, right? Facebook's getting really smart at this and brands are complaining that their numbers are going way, way down for the organic stuff. So it's like, okay, we're starting to see they're figuring out that I only care about things that are important to me. So if I'm promoting, hey, buy my widgets on Facebook in between a post from my mom where she's sharing a recipe, and then my stepmom who shares, like, share this picture and you can win a BMW, like, whatever. But that happens. That's what goes on on Facebook. You're scrolling through, and then I overshare pictures of my kid, and all that stuff happens. But Jay Bear says this eloquently, you're competing against your customer's closest friends and family. And that's a different way to think about it. It's not competing against your competitors on social networks. It's competing against people, people that are close to you and people that are close to your friends. So if it's not relevant, you're toast. I mean, you can't just push out canned updates anymore. And we like to group this in three categories. So high effort, medium effort, and low effort. High effort content is what most of us do on a daily basis. Most of us are focused on blog posts, white papers, webinars, the traditional things. So if you read a job description, nine out of 10 marketing job descriptions talk about high effort content, right? That's something that requires a little more time. It's very good for awareness, but that's all most of us do. Medium effort's Q&A content. Another one I like to use Google for. So when you have a question, you usually go to Google before you call anyone. You're gonna go to Google, you're gonna type in the question, and if Google pulls that information, they'll give you the answer before you even click. So they're just pulling it up. Like you can use a calculator in Google search. So people want answers to questions. As brands, lots of us don't do this. It, this used to be called an FAQ page, and then everyone's like, ah, that's not important. Let's just skip that page. But people want answers to questions, so we have to be educators as brands. The best teacher wins, because if you don't answer my questions, someone else will, and they're probably selling the same thing too, so I'm gonna trust them more. And then low effort content, user generated. So this is Zig Ziglar, 60 years ago, right? Similar situation story. If you can tell me a story about someone like me and how they solved the same problem I'm going through, I'm going to trust you, I wanna hear that. I wanna read about the people using your stuff in a genuine way. So there were some good examples from Jeff there too. So we've started to look at these different types of content and how they're performing. So high effort content, this is the distribution of where it's coming from. So we're, we're tracking this, we have a content marketing platform, it was called Compendium, now it's called Oracle Content Marketing, it's part of our Oracle Marketing Cloud, I'm getting good at the jargon, but um, we can see pretty much everything about a piece of content. And we know what you've done as a visitor, we, can, we know your social media activity, we can pull all of that into a universal view of the customer which really helps us, if we're smart, we deliver content that's relevant based on what we know. But most of this is search, so this makes sense. You create a great piece of content, infographic, white paper, webinar, it's gonna rank really well on search because it appeals to a massive audience. Medium effort content is even higher because this is question and answer. And most of the time when we search, we want an answer to a question. I fixed a refrigerator the other day. <laughs> Michelle knows I can't fix anything. Like I fixed a refrigerator because I found a video that showed me exactly how to take the door off and how to do it. And I fixed the dryer one time and I forgot to unplug it. Like I missed that step, but I didn't die. I didn't get electrocuted. <laughs> but if you can find the answer to your question, that's what you want. So search really well for that, right? Because people are answering questions. And this is for companies. These are B2B companies, some B2C companies. But this is how people are finding their content. And low effort content, which one of these is different, right? This is a user generated story. So they're finding it in lots of places because it gets shared and people care about that and people want the genuine opinion, right? I mean, TripAdvisor's great at this. They used to ask, review your vacation. It used to be review your vacation. Now when you get these emails, it's like, what was your favorite thing about being on the beach at blah, 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 wherever you were? So it's very specific and you share a story by the way, you can upload pictures and videos. So now you're pulling up these vacations and it's like, we went to Jamaica on our honeymoon and one of the resorts, the beach was the size of this stage. No joke. Like it was roped off 
Someone paid like $6,000 for a week there, all inclusive, and it was the size of this stage. Luckily, I was at the one beside that, but if you look at their pictures, it was amazing. Like they had these great angles where you see all the water and all these beach drinks and put your flag out there. And what happened, it was like a thousand people on this stage trying to fit chairs in. And that's what, I mean, we do that. We're marketers, right? We're smart, we're trying to sell stuff. But if you see other pictures and it's someone like me with my foot to give you perspective and then you see like, oh, the beach is like the size of his foot. That's a lot different than a company picture and this is what's happening. So now most importantly, we're looking at visits, how they turn into leads, and then leads to customers, which, uh, yeah, I'm missing there. So I need to have customers under that. But that, those are these numbers. So 3.8%, that's all of the visitors who turn into leads, which industry benchmark, if you believe in industry benchmarks, is about half of that. So this is really good. They're doing a good job with high effort content. And then leads that turn into customers, 3.65%. Those are numbers that keep your job. They're not gonna wow people, but that's doing a really good job. Medium effort content, Q&A. So look at how these numbers are changing. So visits to leads, that's 11.4%, up from 3.8. And then leads to customers is higher. So if you're answering their questions, they trust you more and they want to know more information. And Google has done zero moment of truth. If you guys haven't read that, I have a stat from that in here too. Write that one down, Google zero moment of truth. People refer to it as ZMOT. But it has some amazing data about what's actually happening with search before people buy and when they buy. Some pretty amazing stuff there. Then if we jump into low effort content, look at the leads to customers number, 13.5%. So that's finding the similar situation story. People are sharing their stories. They're talking about how they've solved the problems. And if I find someone that solved the same problem as me, I'm going to feel a lot better about it. I'll buy it. It's not like eBay five years ago. Does everyone remember when you were scared to buy on eBay? You know, I don't really use eBay now because Amazon has almost everything eBay has, but you know, you would be worried. I actually bought a Christmas gift for my brother one time. It was a video game, and uh, I got the box. I was like, this is really light. And this was probably 2006. I was like, this is really light. And I opened it up, and it was a piece of paper. And this is from eBay, paid the price of a video game. I said, hey, your game was not in stock, but here's a free vacation. Call this number. I'm like, what? And I called this number, and well, I knew what it was before I did that, but it's one of those where, oh, come watch a thing about timeshares, and we'll send you to Florida. So instead of the video game, some guy was trying to rip me off. Um, yeah, I got him, whatever. I, it got resolved. I got him kicked off of eBay and found his fax number and sent him a black page like 5,000 times. But um, <laughs> that happened a lot back then. So it's easier to weed that out with the stories. So if you have people sharing their stories, you're going to feel a lot differently about a brand than us just doing our marketing stuff and putting up the best keywords and optimizing those keywords and the A-B testing, which there's always a place for that, but it's moving a needle that only goes so far. And that's what we have to remember. I mean, we can get caught up in growth hacking and all of these cool keywords and great marketing techniques, but it's not going to significantly impact your business. If your business is big enough where you know, a one percentage change makes a dramatic difference, then yeah, you can stick with that stuff. But for a lot of us, we have to think about ways to increase the size of the bucket, not to get more out of it. So on to some examples. Um, B, Bass Pro Shops is not a B2B company, obviously, but I love this example. Um, who, well, I'm not gonna ask you guys because I don't wanna see who answers this question, but most people would not associate Bass Pro Shops employees as bloggers. I think that's a fair assessment. If I want to know how to fly fish or what gear to buy if I'm hunting, I can go there, they're going to know the answer. And that's what I go to Bass Pro Shops for. They have expertise in that area. But they've actually used content marketing to empower every single employee to create content about what they care about. And they'll help them through that. This one is about fly vests. And you can't see this, but, um, oh, I think I do that. Oh, yes. So right here, it's a little blurry on the big screen because I don't have a high res, but this is Arizona. So th this is about fly vests in Arizona. So when someone's reading this post, it may say, well, here's where I actually like to fly fish, and these are my two favorite spots, and these are the lures that work best, and here's the vest that I bought. And each of these things has a link into their store. 
So people can just automatically go in and buy that. And it's very different. I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. Even between Raleigh and Charlotte, it's probably a lot different between outdoors activities, the things that we would like. But the employees at the Charlotte Bass Pro, we actually have a Bass Pro Shops in Cary, they're creating different content. It can be location specific. And that changes a lot as you go across the United States. But this is working for them. And these are not journalists or writers. These are people that know how to fish. They know how to hunt. They know how to put up a tent. They know the best sleeping bag you should buy if you're going to Mount Everest. I mean, they know all kinds of this, all kinds of great information that people care about. And I think everyone has seen this. This has been around for a long time, the long tail search graph. So just plotting high, medium, and low effort content onto this, high effort does get the most traffic. So that's what we like to use for awareness. So you're getting lots of people there. But as you get smaller, this goes back to the Technorati study. If I can create the most influential piece of content to an audience of five, and four of them want to buy the content, I would argue that may be more important than getting 100x of views. So if I care about closing business, I want that relevance. And that's what's happening here. Bass Pro Shops is doing that. They have a 15% click-through rate from their blog, which is on their website, it's just embedded, from the content they're creating into their store. The store is for dollars. So they're using content to get money. And it works. That's what they're doing. Another one is Cvent. Who here has heard of Cvent? Okay, cool, lots of people. So they do event management, they have some awesome software, lots of really smart people. They're around Washington DC area. But event management is not the most glamorous industry. I don't think a lot of us would follow an event management blog, but there are people that do. And they put out great content. They have over 100 people contributing to their content. They're creating posts, it goes through a quick editorial process where they have one person who looks at it, says good, bad, fix this, push it through. And if you see here, um, I mean, this is what people used to do. This is an ad. This is not something that is sourced. They're selling ad space. This is 2014. They're selling ad space because they have a blog that is so relevant in their industry. It's getting all the traffic that Hilton, Sheridan, Hyatt, all of these brands where they can host these big meetings, they're saying, hey, we want to get in front of all the folks who are planning these big corporate events. And they're reading the Cvent blog. So they're making lots of money on ads in 2014, selling their own ad space. That's working. They created over 9,000 content elements in less than two years using this platform. So they have lots of people who can push content through in a quick way to go through moderation. A 325% increase in sales-ready leads. Those are not just marketing qualified, those are sales ready leads. So significant numbers from content marketing. They even won the best corporate blog of the year from the Content Marketing Institute. And that's up against everyone. I mean, every cool company that you follow, every influencer, so the top of the top on the brand equity slide that you saw, I mean, Apple, all of the companies who are putting content out there, Cvent won best corporate blog because it is the concept of content marketing. They're creating content for a relevant audience and they're doing it well. And they're adding value as they do that. This one is Indiana University. So um, all of my analytics and SEO folks will notice there's not a .edu domain up there. This is a different site, weriu.com. So everyone says you want a .edu domain and I'm sure they could have met with 150 people to get approval at Indiana University to get a section of the site for this, but they didn't. They created their own. This is student-generated content. So obviously there's moderation. You can't post like, here's me doing a keg stand and all the stuff that happens in college. It's relevant content, but if we stop and think about students in college creating content, they're going to share it. So as soon as this content posts, they get a notification that says, hey Chris, the post that you wrote about how to manage a social life, getting enough sleep, and keeping your grades high is live. Click here to share it. And that's right in their email. They click to share it, and then it's gonna to go to Facebook and Twitter and wherever else they decide to promote it. But on Facebook, we're pretty closely grouped with our circle, right? So if I'm a college student, I'm going to have a lot of friends that are college students, a lot that may have finished college, and a lot that are considering where to go. So this is recruiting for them. Students are creating content when it posts, they're sharing that content, 
And then there's prospective students that are reading all about Indiana University, and it's not on their .edu domain. These are students telling stories about the college they go to and how much they love it, and this is working well for them. They created 1,200 content elements in the first year with students, college students, that are adjusting to college life, trying to get their work done, trying to keep their social activities going, and 61% were first-time visitors. So that's a pretty significant number. I mean, 61% of their audience could potentially be prospective students. They're coming in and engaging with the company, the brand, for the first time, the educational institution. <clears throat> and I think this is my last example. Are we doing okay on time? One minute? Keep going, wrap it up. Start playing music. So um, emails, everyone replies to emails. Salespeople, tech support, engineers, everyone replies to emails. This is an online tire company. They sell tires online. They were answering 150 questions per week. Tires, not sexy, right? Tires. This one is about what is the best tire for my Honda Odyssey? And you can see this response. I know you can't read the words, but this person goes into a detailed response about what they think about tires for the Honda Odyssey. Here are the three they would recommend. And if it's winter, here's the one that you should buy for the winter. So this content gets sent, right? He may spend an hour on this email, or she may spend an hour on this email. They send the email out, and then it dies in their inbox. Nobody goes back to their inbox and searches the archive to pull out this piece to send it again. They're creating this every single time. So they're BCCing an email address, sending this into their content marketing platform. They have one person that looks at it, and they turn this email into this. They strip out the identifying information. They add some images of the tires. They link that to the store. And here's the kicker. Each link has tracking code specific to the rep. If you know salespeople, they work by money. They get paid for the content they create. So if someone buys a tire from this post, they're getting money in their pockets. And I can bet you every piece of money, every piece of, I don't, piece of stuff, all my stuff, I'll bet you all my stuff that they're going to do this again. If they get paid on a piece of content that they would have sent anyway, they're going to send this through and they're going to love content marketing and it's not staring at a blank screen. It was an email they were doing anyway. So this goes through, they get commission on it, and then if they write one, one was uh, best winter tire for Honda Odyssey, they spun that off into a different post. Then they use their marketing automation platform or their ESP, their email service provider. Every winter, they're sending that email out. And then if they know people with Honda Odysseys, they're sending it directly to them. Every single time a tire is bought, that rep gets paid. So this is content marketing, and it's stuff that was already out there. And that's what I would encourage all of you to think about. You're creating content right now. It may be on the phone. It may be in your inbox. But you can turn that into content that you can sustain and lives forever, and you can use on your site to actually benefit your marketing goals as well as sales goals. This is the last slide, so I think we're okay on time. But Google Zero Moment of Truth. So one of my favorite little pieces of information from that, 10 pieces of content are consumed before a purchasing decision is made. And I think before, the number was uh, 21 pieces are interacted with. I think that's what that said. But 10 pieces of information are consumed. So you want that to be from you. If people are looking at 10 things before they buy, and Jeff Cohen referenced 60% of the sales process happens before they ever talk to sales, so that's significant. They're consuming content. They're making a list. They're saying, these are the three people I want to talk to. If you don't have the content they're consuming before they get to that point, you're not on the list. If you're not on the list, you're not going to sell. And then 87% of CMOs say that profitable growth is their number one priority. So if we connect the dots here, people are consuming content before they buy. We care about making money. Our bosses care about making money. And we need content to help do that. So that's how we look at content marketing. You need to treat it like a teacher. You need to be an educator and tell people everything you can about your brand. And I have tons of other examples if you guys want to chat. Um, one person I recommend following is Marcus Sheridan. So if you care about content, it's the saleslion.com. Um, he was selling swimming pools in the recession. So his business tanked. And then he created a blog where he answered every single question about swimming pools, and his numbers went through the roof. Now he's writing a book on content marketing. He's one of the top content marketing speakers in the country. But it's a great story, and um, he actually answers who are the best 
pool companies in Virginia. He's in Virginia, and he talks about the 10 people he competes with and not his own company, and that's one of his top performing posts because people read that, and they're like, you're a swimming pool company. You're not even on the list. He's like, yeah, no, I'm just trying to help people. These are the best people I would talk to. And then they always get a quote from him because who does that? Who would talk about their competitors and not talk about themselves? But that's how he's using content marketing.